Hey, good morning, church. This is Pastor Ryan. We are in the middle of a three-week preaching series on Paul's letter to the Colossians. This is a short preaching series on one of Paul's shortest letters in the New Testament. Paul probably wrote his letter to the Colossians when he was in prison in Ephesus, about 55 to 57 AD. We have no evidence that Paul planted the church in Colossae. We have no evidence that Paul ever visited the church in Colossae. This is just the old apostle writing a note of encouragement to a young church, an immature church that needed to grow in spiritual maturity. Now, Paul wrote the letter to the Colossians to encourage them to grow up, right? They must not return to the pagan immorality of their past. No, no, no. And, and neither must they retreat to the Jewish legalism of their neighbors. No, that's not the way to maturity either. The way to maturity is, number one, depending on the, Jesus Christ alone to be our righteousness. And number two, depending on the Holy Spirit to grow us up further and to lead us into spiritual freedom. Mature Christians are saved by grace and they offer the grace of God freely. Now, one of the most compelling images in Paul's letter to the Colossians is that of baptism. In baptism, we join Jesus in his death when we are submerged under the water or even when the baby gets a little water put on her head, okay? We join Jesus in his death. And then we join Jesus in his resurrection when we come out of the water and are able to breathe or when the water is dried off the baby's head. Now, in the early church, baptism was a little bit different. The men and the women, they would go to separate pools for the sake of modesty. And the new believers would discard every last stitch of clothing and enter the waters of baptism naked. After being baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, the new Christian would emerge from the waters and they would be given a brand new set of sparkling white clothing. And everyone would be able to see that they had made a clean break from the past, right? To find new life in Jesus Christ. Now it would be absurd to take off those shining white garments and put on the stinky old clothes of the past that represented sin, that represented death. Now this Sunday, we're going to focus on Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 11, where Paul reminds us to discard our sins, to discard our old life, just as the first Christians discarded their old rags at the baptism pool, okay? And then next Sunday, we're going to focus on Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 17, where Paul teaches us to put on the character, to put on the identity of Christ like a fine set of new threads, like those new Christians coming out of the waters of baptism and putting on something that was not their own. The point of the series is to teach us that we have to put to death the sinful ways of our past, and we have to find new life covered in the grace of Jesus. Hear the good news that we are no longer stuck with the permanent stain of sin, that we are no longer stuck with the rips and the tears of our past, that we are no longer stuck with wearing out our mortality because Jesus is going to cover us with his love and his forgiveness and his eternal life. Hear the good news from Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 11. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your heart on things above where Christ is and seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, 
But now you must also rid yourselves of all such of things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you've taken off your old self with its old practices and put it on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge, in the image of its creator. Here, there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. God's word. Have you ever heard Walter Wangren's story, The Ragman? There was once a strong young man who pulled a cart full of clothes and he cried out, rags, new rags for old. I take your tired rags, rags. The rag man, he found a grieving woman who was sobbing into her handkerchief. Give me your rag, he told her, and I'll give you another. And so the woman traded in her wet handkerchief and the rag man, he gave her this beautiful, white linen cloth and the woman was suddenly filled with joy and her tears dried up and as the rag man took the handkerchief and put it to his own eyes he started weeping in her place then the rag man found a girl with vacant eyes whose head was wrapped in a bloody bandage and the rag man looked with love upon the child and he gently whispered to her Give me a rag, and I'll give you another. The ragman removed the bandage and gave the girl a lovely scarf instead. She smiled, and she ran off to play with her friends. And as the ragman wrapped his own head with the bloody bandage that belonged to that girl, he started to bleed in her place. Then the ragman found a homeless man sleeping in an alley, ravaged by addiction and neglect. And the ragman woke him up with the words, give me your rag and I'll give you another. And so the ragman, he removed a smelly army blanket off the man and he fitted him with a brand new set of clothes. As the homeless man woke up full of faith, ready to forgive, ready to be forgiven. The ragman covered himself with a wet handkerchief and a bloody bandage and that man's foul blanket. And he wept and he bled and he staggered on behalf of all those he healed. Now by now you may have figured out the identity of the ragman. He crawled to the top of a landfill, he covered himself with all the filthy rags of humanity, all our grief, all our pain, all our sin, and then he died. And three days later, he rose from the dead because ragman is just a nickname for Christ the Lord. When you meet the ragman for yourself, you have two choices. First, you could try to cover your shame and your pain with your own familiar tired rags. Or number two, you could remove all your clothes and ask the Lord, please dress me. The only way we can ever be saved is when we stop trying to hide our grief, our sickness, our addiction, our lust, our greed, our gossip, our lies, our fragile mortality, and allow Christ the Lord to clothe us in his love. Now, when the disciples peeked into the empty tomb on Easter Sunday, they found that Jesus had disappeared. And what did he leave behind but his folded up grave clothes? He just left the old behind. You don't put on your funeral suit after you raise from the dead. You don't put on your burial dress back on after you raise from the dead. Those old clothes belong to a dead person. And Jesus, who is the resurrection and the life, will cover you with brand new clothes that do not smell like death, that do not define us with who we were in the past. 
Now today's scripture is really about pride. Isaiah 64, 6 tells us, All of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. Please note that Isaiah doesn't say that all of our sinful deeds are like filthy rags. No, all of our righteous acts are like filthy rags. All of our proudest moments, all of our best behavior, that's what's like a filthy rag. What this means is that every single one of us needs to drop the self-righteousness, all the hypocrisy, and to be covered by the grace of Jesus alone. Are you still trying to dress yourself up in your own filthy rags of self-righteousness? Or have you traded your old rags for the righteousness of Jesus Christ? Paul tells us, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. And what that means is that we are gradually dying, not just to the stubborn legacy of the sins of our past, but also to our self-righteousness. We are stripped of our, our old lives, and now we are hidden in Christ Jesus. All of our sin and all of our shame hidden in Christ Jesus. All of our self-righteousness, all of our respectability hidden in Jesus. It's all covered up by the character and the identity of Christ. Now, as much as we want to dress up and look our very best, right? It just doesn't matter because now we are covered in the grace of Jesus alone. Unfortunately, we frequently return to the cozy clothes of our past. If you spend an old time, enough time wearing an old sweatshirt or a comfy pair of sneakers, it can be hard to throw them away. It can be hard to give them to the goodwill, right? It's the same reality with our moral behavior. Instead of being defined by the clothes of Christ, we still want to put on the comfortable and the familiar. Paul gives us two lists of sins. One, a list about desire. The other, a list about disunity you might be tempted to emphasize one list above the other. Please be careful. The moment you minimize your sin in order to maximize the sin of others, you abandon the clothes of Christ for your own filthy rags of self-righteousness. First, Paul addresses the sins of desire. Sexual immorality refers to sex outside of marriage, which was rampant in the Roman world, just as it is today. Impurity refers to a character that is contaminated by sexual sin, such as churchgoers who are addicted to pornography. Lust does not mean the sex drive, which is a gift from God, a good gift from God. Lust refers to uncontrolled sexual urges. Evil desires refers to the loss of emotional control in your sex life. And then Paul seems to change the topic by bringing up greed, the lust for money or possessions, which is idolatry. Now, I, I wonder if Paul was actually being strategic here, because a lot of church folks may feel self-righteous about their sex lives, but they may not be so generous in sharing their wealth with others. The point is, none of us is righteous when it comes to our desires. Second, Paul addresses the sins of disunity. He starts with anger, which is not being upset in the moment. It's holding on to your anger, refusing to let go, not forgiving in the name of Jesus Christ. Then Paul moves on to rage, which is when that anger within explodes into an emotional outburst. Next comes malice, which is when that anger causes us to harm another person. After that, slander, which is when anger provokes us to use dishonorable words to tarnish the reputation of someone else. A lot of gossip is slander. Filthy language comes next. And it doesn't refer to swear words so much as it refers to abusing people 
with your words, using your words as a weapon to hurt people behind their back or in front of their face. Paul concludes by scolding lying because Christians must always speak the truth in love. The sins of disunity are just as damaging as the sins of desire, but they often go uncontested in the polite modern Christian church where gossip gets a free pass, but people talk about the sexual behavior of others. When that happens, churches are divided and Christ is dishonored. When the first Christians went into the waters of baptism to be baptized, everyone discarded their old clothes and everyone discarded their old pretenses. Now, we cannot imagine that level of vulnerability today. And maybe that's why the church continues to struggle to confess our sins and to receive grace in public. Boy, it would be a different church and it would be a different world if we could still pull that off. When the clothes came off, it became completely obvious to everyone that they we're all the same in the skin. Like Adam and Eve before they picked up those fig leaves, we are all created in the image of God. We are all broken. We all have the same need for Christ's salvation equally. And we are all filled with the same Holy Spirit who convicts us of sin and provokes us to grow into mature believers. Paul concludes today's passage by writing, There is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian or Scythian, slaves or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Now, in the early Christian church, slaves were often the spiritual leaders of the church, not their masters that might be a member of the church. Slaves are often the leader, not because their power, not because their prestige, not because of their fancy clothes, because of their spiritual maturity. In the early Christian church, Jews led Gentiles, and Gentiles led Jews. In the early Christian church, women were frequently the highest authority in a congregation. And everyone in the community pointed at the Christians and said, look how they love one another. Oh, the power of vulnerability and honesty and love. That kind of trust only happens when we tell the truth about each other, about ourselves, I should say, not each other. That's gossip. <laughs> when we tell the truth about ourselves. That kind of vulnerability only happens when we freely offer the forgiveness of Jesus Christ to people who have opened up about their pain and their shame. That kind of love only happens when we drop all the pretenses and we get real with one another. That kind of community only happens when believers accept that we are equally created by God and we are in equal need for the grace of God. Friends, it's time to grow up. It's time for the church to be what it is called to be. Let us be free in Christ by the power of God's grace working in us and offered to others. God bless you.